Jewelry for it. I'm incredible. What makes us similar to other people, and yet so uniquely different? Why do we think, feel, and behave as we do? Are we molded more by heredity? Or shaped by experience? How can the same brain that gives us the capacity for creativity, rationality, and love also become the crucible for mental illness? I'm Philip Zimbardo, and for the next 26 programs, we'll be exploring these questions and hundreds more. As a teacher and a research psychologist for the past 30 years, it's been my pleasure to study the most challenging, complex, and puzzling of all creatures. You, me, all of us. The human animal. We'll have to do a lot of traveling in the programs ahead, from inside the brain, outer space. I'm going to hide little Snoopy here in his little room. In our journey, want, we'll see how psychologists I'll work. Hide little Snoopy. Hide him right there. Okay. Attempting to observe and objectively describe the behavior of humans and animals. Good girl. You found him, didn't you? He likes it. He likes for you to find him. They do so hoping to understand what causes that behavior to occur or to change. Psychology is formally defined as the scientific study of the behavior of individuals and of their mental processes. Psychologists then try to use their research to predict and in some cases control behavior. Ideally, out of their basic research will come solutions for the practical problems that plague individuals and society. Open it up for me. So while some psychologists study behavior and mental processes simply because they are fascinating and challenging, Mommy. three times forty-eight. Others work to improve education. Two hundred and eight. To reduce stress. They draw the conflict between Iran and Iraq as a conflict between nations. To promote peace and to counteract violence. So you can see all these But perhaps the best known application of psychology is the treatment of mental and behavioral disorders. And what is your name? Young girl. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how old you are? Seven. I'm seven. I'm in the first grade. Oh, are you? This woman suffers from one of the most dramatic forms of mental illness that psychologists treat. It's called multiple personality disorder, in which several personalities inhabit the same body. I wonder if we might be able to speak with Devon now. Devon? Mm-hmm. Want to talk to Devon? Mm-hmm. It'll be okay. He won't, he won't, he won't get upset or anything? No. Huh? No, you, you haven't learned about how Devin has changed yet. He's, he's quite different now. Is he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's looking forward to this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Each of Make these personalities different. has its own biology. They have different heart rates, just been respiration rates, and different kids. facial expressions. Right. Young Carol was here. Yeah, well, I always follow up the kids. Is that a hard act to follow? Yeah, it's a hard act to follow, let me tell you. How old are you, Devin? 17. Mm -hmm. People with multiple personality disorder have frequently suffered sadistic and repetitive abuse as children. Psychologists believe that these personalities serve both to mask traumatic memories and to cope with the stressful experiences. 
Okay, let's see if we can... While some psychologists treat mental disorders, others undertake scientific research. They are dedicated people watchers who study behavior, observing it under specially arranged conditions, measuring it, and testing it. For many psychologists, the reason to study behavior is the assumption that it's an outer sign of an inner reality, a window providing a glimpse into the workings of the human mind. But psychological researchers who emphasize the essential biological basis of behavior and those who compare the behavior of different organisms study the activities of a wide variety of living creatures, not just humans. Even seemingly minor, insignificant behavior can yield important data about general psychological functions, such as clues about how we process information. Hi, I'm Mr. Dressler. Who are you? Josephine Cuttingana. Josephine. Let's do a little psychological detective work of our own by observing some junior high school girls as they meet a handsome new teacher. Their reactions were filmed for the television series Candid Camera. Notice the difference between the girl's public behavior when the teacher is present and their private behavior once he leaves the room. I'd like to know whether girls would like to be in my class. You're, uh... Yes. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. Will you all bear with me? Can you have patience just a second? Let me answer this. Sentence. I'll be right back. Twenty-four. Would you mind being in my class? In the no, I'll be with Mimi. Thank you. Excuse me a minute. Will, okay. you, will you all wait for me just one second? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. The behavior of dozens of girls in this situation was captured by candid camera producer Alan Funk. Let's focus on just one aspect of their many reactions. Why are these girls laughing? When I asked a large number of my students about the girls' behavior, they came up with a range of explanations. That the girls were laughing because they were either nervous, excited over their good fortune, showing their friends how cool they were, or laughing in eager anticipation of a novel event. Feeling self-conscious, feeling sexually aroused, or lastly, and by far the most common explanation, that they were simply showing a typical reaction of adolescent girls. Of course, if the last explanation were true, then we'd expect to see different behavior from a group of adolescent boys. Let's see what happens if we repeat the same situation using boys in an out-of-the-ordinary female teacher. Hi, nice to meet you. Joe Paul. Nice to meet you. My name is Miss Darling and I'm going to be a new teacher in social studies. Despite some behavioral differences between them, the boys had the same basic reaction as the girls. You're wanted on the phone, Miss Darling. Would you follow me, please? Oh, would you wait here for me a couple of minutes? I'll be right back. But before we try to answer why the youngsters reacted as they did, ask yourself how you reacted as a viewer. Did you laugh too? If so, ask yourself why. Was it because, as most of my students thought, we naturally tend to empathize with the children because we remember being in awkward situations at that age too? Was it because you felt uneasy observing their private reactions to sexual titillation? A kind of voyeur's guilt. <laughs> or 
did you laugh because you experienced a violation of expectations about how teachers are supposed to look and act? Remembering back to how your teachers actually look and behave. Were you reacting emotionally to the same violation of expectations that the children were experiencing? Holy mackerel!